Well, amen. Take your Bibles this morning in the New Testament book of Acts. Acts this morning, chapter 20. And I want to get right into the message. Uh, you know, if you were to stand at the pearly gates and God says, why should I let you into my heaven? What could you say? What could you say? That right there, I plead the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Acts chapter 20, the Acts of the Apostles is a wonderful book and one of my favorite books because it gives us the history of that very first church in the first century. It's the church that the Lord Jesus established with those first apostles as he called them out when he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And he said there in Matthew in the Gospels, upon this rock, the profession of faith of Peter, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he would establish his church and he did that in his earthly ministry and he did that after his ascension after that we find the church uh, that he established the churches they continued to grow they continued to spread out in fact uh, they would have probably all stayed there in Jerusalem had it not been for persecution coming down and so that drove them out but also we find that the Apostle Paul and others took the gospel around their world in that day. In fact, we find in Acts 17 that these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. Would to God that today of the church of Jesus Christ that it be said, we're turning the world upside down for Jesus. My good friend and mentor, Dr. Joe Patterson, he pastors Crossroads Baptist Church in Whitesboro, Texas. He said, they turned it upside down, but really, they turned the world right side up because the world is upside down today, amen? And so uh, we understand this, and we understand the history of that early church, but understand also that they were not always welcomed into the community. In fact, we find that as people were saved, as devils were cast out, that many were hurt financially who were profiting off of false religions. And so when Christ come in uh, through the gospel message and the blood of Jesus covers all sins, they didn't need works, they didn't need idols, they didn't need to burn candles and incense. Some people got mad about it. And time and again we find stories throughout the New Testament of both Christians and pastors and apostles suffering greatly for their faith and their ministry. When you go to Hebrews chapter 11, what is called God's Hall of Faith, and you find there many named but many unnamed uh, martyrs of the faith who died, horrible deaths, some of them, at the hands of people who hated the Lord Jesus Christ. And they hated all who followed Him. That has kind of been the underlying theme of most of my messages in recent uh, months and uh, they are messages of both warning and encouragement. They're messages of both rebuke and yet exhortation. And they are messages of both intense concern and love for the people of Liberty Baptist Church of whom God has entrusted me to be your pastor. And so this morning I want to share a message with you that I'm hoping will be stamped and imprinted on your minds as Leonard Ravenhill said, God, stamp eternity on my eyelids. I'm praying that God would stamp this on your hearts and minds of every believer here at Liberty Baptist Church. Would somebody do me a favor and grab me a bottle of water? Brother Copeland, if you could do that, that would be great. This Diet Dr. Pepper is not going to cut it today. I've got what Joe Biden had in the debate the other day. I've got a bit of a cold. I can't talk. No, I'm fine, but I need a little bit of water. Let's look in Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. I'm sorry about that. I couldn't help it. Verse 17 says, And from Miltus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And now I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, 
but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. What did he teach? Repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit into Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. He knew what was waiting for him. Now listen to this right here. But none of these things move me, neither count I myself dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus. To do what? To testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, let verse 24 sink in. Thank you, sir. Let verse 24 sink in for just one moment. Notice what it says. Paul says, he knows all the things that are coming. All that he's been through, and God has revealed all the things he's going to go through. And here's what he says. None of these things move me. Now, folks, I, b- I believe that there's some folks perhaps that need to be moved. But you find the right place and the right purpose, and you serve the right person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You're not serving a pastor. You're not really even serving each other. You're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And then you drive down a stake in that place, and by the grace of God and for God's glory, you say, you know what? I'm not moving. This is my place, this is my purpose, and I'm not moving. For me, there's no place like this place, anywhere near this place, so I guess this must be the place that God has put me. And if I die here one day, if the Lord Jesus tarries his coming, let me die behind this pulpit, amen, preaching the word of God. Let me go and just go be with Jesus, amen. So every person who's ever professed the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of their life, could say, I wish this were true. None of these things moved me. Our world today is so much different, is it not? It's different. If, you know what? If everybody got saved, think about this. If everybody that got saved never quit, if everybody that surrendered to ministry never quit, what would Christianity look like today? We would have turned the world upside down by now. But the fact of the matter is there's many people, in fact, I say this, most people who cannot be counted on by the Lord Jesus. And the fact of the matter is there's many people who have quit on the Lord. But Paul said, none of these things are going to move me. You know what? I thank God for people like that. We've got some people in our church like that. And and they've just, you know what? It don't matter. It doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter what people think. None of these things shall move me. Folks, things around us are changing quickly. Do you understand that right now? Culture's changing quickly. Communities are changing. Countries are changing. And folks, churches are changing as well. But tell you, let me tell you this. Clergy, that's the pastors, they're changing. And you're finding now that it is right before us, men that stand and name the name of Christ, and they're wishy-washy. You don't know where they are. They're all over the place. I don't want to be that kind of man. I don't want to be that kind of a father. I don't want to be that kind of a husband. And I don't want to be that kind of a pastor. I want people to know there he is, there he stands, and none of these things shall move him. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people. They just find life... Of serving God in ministry, just too difficult. And many are leaving the pastorate altogether. Why? Because it's, as a pastor, my first pastor I worked for told me, the ministry is not for weenies, pansies. Why? Jesus said it, in this world you shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer though, I've overcome it. In the end we win, amen. I was watching a YouTuber uh, this week called Wretched Radio, and, and I listen to him every once in a while. He's got some good stuff, but 
he's reformed into all of that uh, Presbyterian garbage and the Westminster and all that. It's, listen, if it's not in the Bible, I don't care. And he was being very self-righteous and pious. And he was talking about these pastors that have messed up and, uh, and, 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 you know, and some of them made some pretty serious shipwrecks of their life. And I'm not excusing that behavior. But how dare he stand and judge a man of God and then right after that, in a joking, mockingly way, used Queen, you know the band Queen, Freddie Mercury, he was an admitted homosexual, used their song, Another One Bites the Dust, to mock men of God that are just humans that fail. We don't need to mock them, we need to pray for them, and we need to love them, and we need to lift them up, because the reality is that's all of us. There's none of us that are perfect. That's why I've told you, don't look at me, look at Jesus. Amen? You know, the Lord Jesus was a very loving and patient man when it came to sinners. But the one thing that he could not tolerate was the self-righteous Pharisee that was constantly judging others. So if there's a time of spirit, for spiritual steadfastness, if there was ever a time for commitment and determination, it is right now, church, are you listening to me? It's right now in these days of spiritual carnality and spiritual convenience and spiritual compromise. And the fact of the matter is the devil is constantly seeking to get us to do what? Move away from the Word of God. That's what he wants. To move away from the will of God. That's what he wants. He don't want you hearing the Word of God and knowing it, and he certainly don't want you doing it but then he wants you really to move away from the work of God. There's a movement out there because churches have messed up and because churches are not perfect. That's why I really don't like the mega church model. But why? Because it's a business. And once a business grows that big, it's a, it becomes all about the money and paying the bills. And then the word of God gets compromised. And the will of God gets compromised. And the work of God gets compromised. Why? we got to pay the bills. And the sad thing that happens in those situations is Jesus likened the church to what? A body. And let me just say, church, when a body becomes a business, it's a prostitute. Okay? And that's as nicely as I can say it. And unfortunately, many churches, even with Baptists on the side, have prostituted themselves out as a church all for money's sake. You know what I think about money? I don't think about money. That's it. I can't tell you what the offering was last week. I couldn't tell you who gave last week. You know why? I'm not called to mess with money. I'm called to preach the Word of God. And I know this to be true. If God wants this church here, God will provide through the people that God brings into this church. And when God don't provide, he's telling us, I don't need Liberty Baptist Church anymore. Amen? And I'll go do something else. But right now, God has called us here, and God provides, and he continually provides for 47 years. Amen? Praise God. Paul says, you know what? All these things out there, none of these things move me. I want you to notice a few things that Paul determined that he would not allow to move him. And I hope that you'll determine these things today. Number one, Paul said, you know what? I'm not going to let people move me. There are leaders and there are followers. Leaders stand strong, real leaders. Followers move. They're wishy-washy. And friend, you need to be a leader, amen? You need to be a leader for Jesus Christ. You need to be a champion for the cause of Christ. Look in verse... Uh, 18 of Acts 20. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, what manner I have been with you at all seasons. In other words, you know what I'm like. All times of the year, all the seasons of life. And what is it? Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. What were the Jews doing? They were doing the same thing they tried to do to Jesus. 
They tried to constantly trip him up. They tried to constantly make him fall. They wanted him to fall. They wanted him to fail. Consider, first of all, the opposition from without and how it could not move Paul. Verse 19 says, I'm serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the land and weight of the Jews. Now, Acts chapter 9, verse 23 says this. This is the chapter of his salvation testimony. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to do what? To kill him. When he converted from a a religious Pharisee to a born-again child of God, simply saying to Jesus, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Jews said they want to kill him. And then in chapter 14 and verse 19, it says, And there came hither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. They're a bunch of pansies. They're a bunch of cowards. You want to do something, do it yourself. Don't go get people to do your dirty work. And they persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing that he'd been dead. They literally stoned Paul to death. And you know what I believe? I believe he died. But you know what? God had a better purpose and a better plan. And God raised him up, I believe. And everywhere Paul went, what was there? There was opposition. Opposition. Everywhere he went, there were people. Now, we're, we're, talk, we're, we're applying this to our lives as Christians. Everywhere he went, there were people trying to hinder his efforts. Somehow Christians today have developed this idea that they're never going to face difficulty as long as they serve Jesus Christ. But the truth of the matter is Christianity has always faced opposition and resistance and pushback. Do you understand that? From the days of Jesus Christ himself, Christianity has always faced this opposition. It's never been easy to stand for the Lord Jesus. And it never will be. It's never been easy to serve the Lord Jesus. And folks, it never will be. But we must, pleading the blood of Jesus, do it. And I'll tell you right now, you're going to have tears. You're going to have tears. Paul said, remember not that for the space of three years, I prayed with tears over you. I could fill a lake with all the tears I've shed over the folks of this church over these 22 years. You know what? It's never going to be easy to serve. There's going to be tears. There's going to be trials. And in those trials, the devil is tempting you. See, God brings uh, testing to cause you to do what? To stand, to be strong. The devil brings temptation for what? for you to be weak and to fall. Grab hold of that this morning. It's either a temptation of the devil or a test of the Lord. The devil wants you to fail. God wants you to succeed, and you can. But there's going to be troubles. Acts 20, verse 19, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with tears and temptations, which befell me, how? By the lying and weight of the Jews. Now, understand this. Understand this. And I believe Bob Jones Sr. said it originally or something like this but let me give you my version of it anything that's moving against the grain are you listening will always create friction our world is going to hell and for anybody going to hell this morning not me I'm going to heaven amen and so you know what that says I'm going in the opposite direction of the world So what is that going to cause? That's going to cause friction. The doors of success always swing on the hinges of opposition. And if you don't want to be criticized, you don't like being criticized, then simply do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing for the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll never be criticized. But every minute you start doing something, the very minute you start doing something for the Lord Jesus, and you do it for His sake in the gospel, somebody's going to criticize you. You know what Paul said? None of these things move me. I was, there's a video, I would love to show it to you, but unfortunately it's got some expletives that are not church friendly. But Dana White, the president of the UFC, one of the founders, is a guy that I have great respect for. I don't think he's a Christian, but he's a man. He said, you know what? And he, don't, he doesn't do any of that woke 
liberal garbage. He stands against every bit of it. So he's got something going on in there. Maybe he'll be saved. I don't know. But he said this, you know who I am. You know how I am. And I don't apologize for any of that. If you don't like it, and then he said some things I can't repeat. You know what he was saying? None of these things move me. I'm going to do what I believe is right, and I don't care. Listen, this guy's turned down millions, if not billions of dollars of endorsement because he wouldn't let them uh, cause him to uh, advertise certain things and give in to certain things and not say certain things. You know what he said? None of these things are going to move me, not even billions of dollars. So here, here's the thing, church. If you're waiting for the world to applaud you, approve you, and accept you because of your Christian faith, you're going to be waiting a long time. Paul said none of these things move me. Why? Because he had opposition from without, but he would not move him. Notice, secondly, there were obstacles from within that could not move Paul. Look at verse 19. With oppositions from within. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the laying in weight of the Jews. Understand, Paul was a Pharisee. He was a part of the group. Paul was a Jew of the Jews, and the Bible says circumcised on the seventh day, which was the Jewish tradition for boys. And listen right here. Paul was hated by his own people. Why? Because he had been murdering Christians and persecuting Christians. And then on, in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, while breathing out threatenings and slaughter, the Lord Jesus comes, knocks him down with a blinding light, and says, here's his response. Who are you? I'm Jesus. I'm the one that you're going against. I'm the one you're persecuting. And he said, holy mackerel, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's his salvation testimony right there. Lord, what he, Harry Ironside said this, God is looking for broken men who have judged themselves in the light of the cross of Christ when he wants anything done. He takes up men who have come to the end of themselves whose confidence is not in themselves but in God Almighty. Amen? The men he waited uh, just looking for a chance to murder the Apostle Paul. Listen to these verses. And I'm going to have to hurry. 2 Corinthians eleven sixteen 16 says this, I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in the, this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also, for ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves wise, for ye suffer if a man bring uh, you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take you, if a man exalt you, if a man smite you on the face. He goes, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews or Jews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. He's talking about to them. I'm more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oftentimes of the Jews. Listen to this. Five times I received, this is scourging, 40 stripes save one. Five times he was Beaten, scourged like Jesus, 39 lashes. The Jewish historian Josephus, he's not canonized scripture, but he's a great historian of the Jewish times. He said the scourging was so bad, and you remember it's a single post, they tied their hands to it, they stripped them naked, and they beat them with two guys with a cat of nine tails, beating them and filleting them, basically, and they often stood in a pool of blood, and I don't want to be too graphic here, but their inner organs lying at their feet, and a lot of people did not survive scourging. That's one of the great miracles of the crucifixion process is Jesus didn't die at the scourging post. He goes on in verse 25, he says, 
Thrice I was beaten with, ro- beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. We read about that. Thrice I was suffered a shipwreck. And this is a part, this would freak me out, not knowing what's deep down under that water, some octopus or shark or something. A night and a day I've been in the deep. That's out in the ocean. In journeyings often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily is what? In spite of all of that, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I am, and I am not weak? Who is offended? And I burn not. If I must needs glory, here's what I'm going to glory in. I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. And God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Artis, the king kept the city of Damascus with a garrison desirous to do what? Apprehend me. And through a window in a basket, I was let down by the wall and escaped his hand. Then on top of it all, there were Christians that forsook, in the light of all these things he endured for Jesus, there were Christians that forsook him in the midst of the ministry. 2 Timothy 4, 9 says, Demas, he was in the ministry, he was with him, hath forsaken me, having to, why? Why did, he, why did he leave the ministry? He loved this present world. He wanted the things the world has. Now, the average pastor today, you know how long they last in, this, in a pulpit? Three years. Three years in Southern Baptist churches. You know why? Oftentimes, five disgruntled people in a church will cause a pastor to leave. You know what I'll do? Five disgruntled people in this church can pack their bags and go somewhere else and be a blessing to some other pastor. None of these things move me. Yet everywhere you go, you're going to face people, what? They won't accept you. They're not going to appreciate you. And they're certainly not going to applaud you. And I'm not just talking to pastors. I'm talking to you, church. Amen? So what are you going to do this morning? Are you going to, are you going to wiggle out and you're going to weenie out? Or are you going to say, like Paul, I don't care. None of these things move me. You know what he did? He kept on serving the Son of God, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. And that word serving is written in the Greek in the present participle. You know what it means this? He continued to serve no matter the opposition and the, all, and the obstacles. And folks, Paul never stopped ministering. Why? He never did it. He never stopped because of people. Why? Because he ultimately understood, I'm not serving people. I'm serving Jesus. Amen? It was not the love of the people that motivated Paul. It was his love for the Lord Jesus that motivated him. Paul not only kept on serving the Lord Jesus, but he kept on sowing the word of God. Notice what it says in verse 20. Woo, oh, it's good to tell today. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, what? Repentance towards God and faith, here it is, faith and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Vance Habner said this, It's not our business to make the message acceptable, but to make it available. We're not to see that they like it. We're to see that they get it. Amen? And Paul never allowed opposition from without and obstacles from within to do what? To keep him from serving the Son of God and sowing the Word of God. Amen? So what did he do? He made up his mind, and I pray that someone's going to make up their mind this morning. It doesn't matter what happens. And folks, I, t- I told you a couple of weeks ago, and, and, I, and I told you this, uh, the, uh, something's coming. I don't know what it is. This election stuff is, uh, I know God's ultimately in control, amen, and I know we need to do what we need to do, but something's coming. And I pray that it's the Lord Jesus, amen. But things are getting ready to change big. Something's getting ready to happen, and I don't know exactly what it is, but I want you to be prepared for whatever it is, amen? And Paul made up his mind, you know what? It doesn't matter what comes. They can come and shut this place down. You know what? We're going to meet and have church. 
They can give out mandates and warnings and, and whatever. I don't care. They can arrest me. We're going to preach the word. None of these things shall move me. But you know what? He not only let, did not let people move him, but he didn't let problems move him. Verse 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. What? The Spirit of God had hold of him, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. You know what? Paul anticipated that things were going to get rough, that problems were coming, that he was going to face some serious things. On, at, I mean, he's already named some things that he's endured. He knew these things. Yet knowing full well what lay ahead, what did he do? He determined, you know what? People aren't going to stop me. Amen? And problems aren't going to stop me either. None of these things shall move me. And, and, and you know what? And yet I see so many Christians today that quit for any little pee-picking reason under the sun. But not Paul. Acts 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither I count my life dear unto myself. You know what he's saying right there? I don't care if they kill me. Don't threaten me with heaven. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Hallelujah. So that I might, why? Why do I not count my life dear? I want to finish my course with joy and the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Notice first of all the conviction that held Paul in verse 22. He says, I, I go bound in the spirit. You know why I'm standing before you this morning? The Spirit of God called me to the ministry. It's not a career choice. I was, I was not one of those 18-year-olds that my mama called and daddy sent and went off to Bible college and comes back and works my way. Listen, I, I was decently successful in business, established, making good money, and God called me. And God called my wife. I was bound in that moment in the spirit to say yes God or no God. To be in God's will or to be out of God's will. And Paul says, I'm going to finish my course. Why? I've received it of the Lord. Notice that conviction that he held right there. It's a high calling. It's a holy calling. It's a heavenly calling. Amen? It's not that just somebody decides one day, you know what, I think I'm going to go be a pastor. Get me a little house with a white picket fence and perfect children and a perfect wife and I'll never have any problems. I got a little car and a, a couple of little cars and, you know, a little church over here and it's just, man, it's just going to... People don't... That don't happen. It don't happen that way. It happens the way it happened to Paul on the road to Damascus when God said, Hey! I saved you. Now I'm calling you to serve me in this particular way. Paul was not bound by a career. He was what? He was bound by a calling, amen? And if there was ever a need for a generation of men and women and boys and girls who would be bound by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by what your body feels like, I'm just tired. Well, join the club. Bound by the power of the Spirit to do what? To be faithful, fearless, and fervent in these evil days. Amen? So there's a conviction that Paul held, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to speed it up. Notice the concern that not only held, uh, the conviction that held Paul, but the concern that helped Paul. Look in verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears. Now skip down to verse 23. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Listen, see, Paul was not bound uh, by conviction only, but he was burdened with concern. He was burdened with it. Late in life, Evangeline Booth, at the age of 81, this is uh, the then general of the Salvation Army, was asked when she had first wanted to be a part of the ministry, and here's what her reply was. Very early, I saw my parents, General William Booth and his wife, I saw my parents, founders of the Salvation Army, working for their people, bearing their burdens day and night. They didn't have to say a word to me about what real Christianity looked like. I saw it lived out every day in their lives. You want me to tell you something, church? People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Amen? 
It's nice to know the Word of God, and it's nice to be able to expound the Word of God, but if you don't show genuine concern and care and love, they don't want to hear it. Amen? Charles Spurgeon made a very profound statement. He said this, If you do not truly have a burning desire, listen, this is powerful, if you in your life do not truly have a burning desire to see other people saved, then you yourself have never been truly saved. Oh, man. I read that and I'm like, that's powerful. Because there's a lot of people sitting on church pews today that they don't even think about unsaved people. They don't even think about millions dying and going to hell every minute. Someone goes into eternity. You think they're all going to heaven? No, Jesus said most of them, most of them are going to hell just like that. One, two, three, in hell for all eternity. And folks, that ought to break our hearts, amen? And here's a, here's a statement I found. You can, you can give at the altar. You can give to others without loving, but you cannot say you love without giving. Don't say I love Jesus and you don't give. Amen? You don't love Jesus, you love your money. Acts 20, 31, therefore watch and remember that for the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now notice the last thing. Paul would not let people stop him. Amen? Teens, have you decided, you know what, it doesn't matter what these kids at school think, I'm going to serve Jesus. Amen? It doesn't matter even, unfortunately, we've got a lot of children whose parents don't go to church, but, and you've got to obey your parents, amen? But you've also got to decide when it comes to Jesus, I'm not letting anybody stop me from loving and serving Jesus. He wouldn't let problems move him. People, problems, not going anywhere. You know what? He wouldn't let pride move him, amen? Ooh. That's a tough one because we all have it. Every sin falls into one of three categories, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I'm going to tell you right now, the hardest of the three to get rid of is pride. What caused the devil to fall? Pride. He saw what God had. He saw what God was. He saw what God created. And Satan was a created being, Lucifer, the son of the morning star. And here's what he said, I will, I will, I will. He had a big eye problem, didn't he? With pride, he says, I'm going to be like God, the most high. I'm going to build my kingdom bigger than his. I'll set up in the sides of the north. And God cast him out. Pride, why? Look at verse 24, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. See here, when you begin to think about yourself as something, hear me church, when you begin to think about yourself as something, you're on your way to doing nothing for God. When you begin to think about yourself as, you know what, I'm something, I'm somebody, I'm someone, you're on your way to doing nothing for God and being nothing for God. Romans 12, 3 says, we know verse 1 and 2, but he says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, hallelujah, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. Amen. God has given some people a level of faith because of their actions towards him that's greater than others. But you know what? We don't look down and go, look at me, I'm super spiritual and you're not. No. We grab our brother and sisters by the hand and we pull them up and we take them with us on to glory. Amen? And we help strengthen their faith. Pride is the root of compromise and pride has always been the problem and it's always dishonored, disgraced, and displeased God. Amen? Listen to what Proverbs said. We were in Proverbs last week. But Proverbs 16, verse 18 and 19 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's me thinking, hey, you know what? I'm the biggest and I'm the best. It goes before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly 
than to divide the spoil with the proud. James 4, 6 says, God resisteth the proud. You come to God cocky and arrogant, he ain't hearing your prayer. In fact, he'll resist you. No way. That's why the Bible says, humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of God, that he may exalt you in due time. He says, God resists the proud. He gives the grace to the humble. So what Paul determined, you know what, people aren't going to move me. No way. If there's peer pressure, I'm going to be the peer pressure. And I'm following Jesus. Amen? Problems aren't going to move me. And pride's not going to move me. You know what? Paul had no ambition, so there was nothing he could be jealous about. Amen? His, his ambition was only to follow Christ, so he had nothing to worry about. His, he had no reputation, so he had nothing to fight about. He had no possession, so he had nothing to worry about. He had no rights, so he had nothing to, be suffer, to suffer wrongly for. He laid it all on the altar. Everything I am, everything I have is God's. So I know both how to thrive and I know how to suffer. I know the good and man, I know what it's like to be in the bad. I know how to abound and I know how to be defrauded. Listen, he was already broken so no man could break him. He was already dead in the flesh so no man could truly kill him. He was less than the least. He says, you know what, when it comes to sinners, I'm the biggest one. Folks, this is the Apostle Paul saying this. So no one could humble him by accusing him. He said, I know. You come to me and go, yeah, you're, you need to get some things right, Paul. Yeah, I know. I know. The things I want to do, I find myself not doing those things. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing those things. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this this corpse, this, this death that keeps pulling me down. He suffered loss of all things, so you know what? No man could take his stuff. So what did Paul do? Let me give you two quick things. Number one, he focused on the finish line, amen? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Focus on the finish line? Keep the author of our Jesus, amen? He's, I'm not the author of our faith. Jesus is. And who's who we're looking to? Paul would later write, I count on myself to have apprehended. I've not arrived. I'm not what I need to be. But this one thing I do, hear that one thing. I'm holding up two things. Uh, one thing. Forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching forth unto those things that are before. I press. You know what that means, that word means? Landon's a runner. He's a soccer. It means to agonize to the goal, to stretch, to move, to hurt, whatever it takes, to agonize. I agonize to the goal so that I might win the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Amen? And I'm doing it by looking to Jesus. He's the goal, the author and the finisher of our faith. The men and women who have changed the world are men and women whom the world could not change. Amen? I read this week about another Christian music star who made some really stupid comments. Dan Hasselton, he's from the band Jars of Clay. They've been around for over 20 years. They're still out there. And he sent out a message on the X platform, which was formerly Twitter until Elon Musk bought it and made it a a free speech platform again, and here's what he said. Now listen to this guy who professes to be a child of God and a follower of Jesus Christ. It's perhaps less important to know what is right and wrong, morally speaking, than to know how to act towards those we consider wrong. I don't particularly care about the Scripture's stance on what is wrong. I care more about what it says or how it says we should treat people. I agree that we should treat people with kindness, with grace, 
with mercy. But you know what I care more about? Thus saith the Lord. The Word of God. I don't care about your feelings. I don't care about what you think. And you don't have to care about my feelings or what I think. All we need to be concerned with is what does the Word of God say? And listen, I love sinners because I am one. Amen? And Jesus loves sinners, but you know what He wouldn't do? He never justified their sin and made them feel comfortable in their sin. The woman taken in adultery, brought to Him, and the men were there ready to stone Him. He goes, okay, stone her. That's what the law says. She's an adulterer, stone her. He says, okay, the one without sin, no, the one of you that has no sin, you, do the first, you throw the first stone. It says the eldest, the oldest men from the youngest men started dropping their stones right there. And it, Jesus looked up and he said, woman, where are thine accusers? And she says, no one's around anymore, Lord. No one's condemning me. He said, I'm not condemning you either. Listen, remember what from last week? She was already condemned. She was already lost and on her way to hell. He goes, I'm not condemning you. You're condemned already. He says, neither do I condemn you. And here's what he said. Go and don't do that garbage anymore. Sin no more. You know what he did in that scenario? He loved her and he didn't let her say, you know what, you can love Jesus and be saved and then go live however you want to. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said, being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than it is about courageously and actively doing God's will. And here's the deal, if you are actively pursuing God's will and doing it, you're not going to have time to be sinning. Amen? And folks, I, listen, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to become a has-been. Amen? I don't want to be a used-to-be. Somebody that used to be a soul winner. Somebody that used to be a Baptist. Somebody that used to be a pastor. Somebody that used to preach the Word of God. Somebody that used to be a Christian. So here's some questions, and we're just about done. What would it take to get you to move? What would it take to get you to compromise your faith? It might be something that's already going on in your life. What would it take to get you to change what you say you believe to something you said you would never believe? The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience. The ultimate measure of a man or a woman is, is how they stand in times of challenge and controversy. Amen? The measure of a man or a woman comes down to moments, listen to this, spread out like dots of pain on the canvas of life. Everything you were, everything you'll someday be resides in the small, seemingly ordinary choices of everyday life. Each decision seems as insignificant as a left turn on an unfamiliar road when you have no destination in mind. But the decisions you make, accumulate in your life until you realize one day that you, by your decisions, have made you the person you are. Folks, that's powerful. You know, you can easily judge the character of a person by how they treat those. And can, who can, listen, this is how you can judge the character of a person. How they treat those that can do give nothing to them and do nothing for them. That's it. That's why James said, pure and undefiled religion before the Father is this, to visit the fatherless. They're not going to give you anything. They can't do anything for you. And the widows in their affliction. Folks, we're too near home to turn back, amen? Notice the last thing. He was faithful to the Father. Focused on the finish and faithful to the Father, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, to be happy about it, and the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul understood that only one thing was this. 
Here's what he deserved, a one-way ticket to hell. He understood that. But the Lord Jesus came to him one day and sought him out and saved him. Aren't you thankful for that day when you experienced that? I hope that you can say, I've experienced that, amen? And Paul's life was never the same. And like I said last week, you can't give me one example in the Bible of someone that was saved and then went and lived the same way they did before they were supposedly saved. Not one example. Paul's life was never the same. His life, his ministry, his purpose, his goal was what? To serve the one that loved him and gave himself for him. So there's people, there's problems, there's pride. Paul said, none of these things move me. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of God. Listen, for as much as you know your labor, hear me church, your labor's not in vain. My banking account's not here. It's over there. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, 18, For the Lord himself shall descend from the cloud with a shout and the voice of the archangel and Jesus is coming soon church and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord wherefore comfort one another with these words why because your labor is not in vain Jesus is coming Titus 2 13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ amen so now is not the time to let people move you Now's not the time to let problems move you. <laughs> Now's not the time to let pride move you, amen? Someone's wrote a poem, and I, I want to close with this. I think it's very fitting to close with. Here's what it says. If you're looking for a revival, just preach on. Preach on sin and condemnation. Preach for sinners and his salvation. Preach the Christian's consecration, but preach on. If your sermon's from the Lord, then preach on. Never mind if they look bored. Anybody looking bored out there? Never mind if they look bored. Just preach on. If the devil looks down on it, if the critics frown upon it, many souls depend upon it, so preach on. If you step on someone's corns, well, preach on. Take the bull right by the horns and preach on, even though we may not like it. Even though some may try to fight it, where there's wrong, the Lord will be right. So preach on. Let no time be restriction. You know what this means right here, right? Absolutely nothing. Just preach on. If the sinner's not got conviction, then preach on. Christ can save his soul from hell and cleanse his heart and make him well. Even if it's after 12, just preach on. From the law to revelation, yes, preach on. Christ for every situation. Oh, my friend, preach on. Even if your members doubt it and say they can do without it, if you'll talk with God about it, just preach on. Think of Christ's own message clear and preach on. For all who wish to hear, oh, my friend, preach on. All are sinners and they must know that His blood did freely flow. He can wash them white as snow but you better preach on. In the Holy Ghost power, oh, preach on. He'll reward you in His hour. Just preach on. Broken hearts and sins forgiven. Blessings here so freely given and a crown up there in heaven. So just preach on, serve on, sing on, give on and go on and let none of these things move you away from Christ's call. Dietrich Bonhoeffer again said, if I sit next to a madman and he drives a car into a group of innocent bystanders, I can't, as a Christian, simply wait for the catastrophe to happen. Then try and comfort the wounded and bury the dead. I must try to wrestle the steering wheel out of the hands of the madman driver. Why do I use that illustration? Because it's time for you and I to do what? To stand up, to speak out, listen to me, and to stand out for Jesus. And let nothing, let nothing move us from that mission. Amen? Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed.
Oh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for the day that you've given us and the time that we can join together our hearts and minds and hear your word. And God, that we can be encouraged. Oh, yes, there's some rebuke in there. We all need it, every one of us, including this pastor. Oh, yeah, we need to be reminded, Father, of that one thing that Paul said, this one thing I do. And forgetting about all the other, one thing, that's following Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. One heartbeat away, and that'll be the only thing that matters. Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Jesus will last. God, we like to think sometimes that we'll live forever, but the reality is that none of us have that, that promise. None of us have that assurance that we'll live past tomorrow. So we must live today as if you're coming for us today or tomorrow. And that, that entails just driving the stake down like Paul said. He goes, you know who I am. You know what I believe. He said it, I know whom I believed in and I'm persuaded that he, Jesus, is able to keep that which I've committed to him. What is that? His eternal soul committed to Jesus. He's keeping it. He's got it. It's, it's, it's secure. That's grace. And thank you, God. But Lord, for Christians, let us not be a disgrace to your grace. Let us live. Let us, like Paul, say, we're not letting any of these things move us. And so we stand fast. We stand firm. We stand up. And we speak out in the name of the Lord Jesus, His Word. Oh God, we, we're not to be obtuse and mean and self-righteous. We're all just sinners saved by grace. But Father, in love, we're to preach the Word. We're to share the Word. We're to love the sinners that need Jesus. We're to, we're to love those that are perhaps Christians or profess Christ and, and maybe made a decision for Christ, but they're living for themselves and for the devil. Any life lived for self is a life lived for the devil. We don't like to say that, but that's true. So God, my prayer this morning is you would have your will in your way. Number one, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice that's never given their life to Jesus Christ. They, in other words, in their heart and mind, they know, I can't go back to a time, a day, a moment, a second where... In repentance of my sins, knowing I'm a sinner, and by faith in Jesus, I ask him to forgive me and to save my soul. If there's somebody here that don't remember that time, they can't go back to that time, and they don't have an assurance of if they died today, where they would spend eternity. God, I pray they would do that right now. I pray, Lord, that uh, like that preacher's wife that got saved after a revival, she said, I'm not willing to go to hell for anybody. I don't care what they think. And maybe somebody here, they're, they're a little nervous, a little scared, but they don't want to go to hell. They want to go to heaven when they die. So, Father, that's why in a moment we're going to bow our heads and close our eyes, and we're going to give an, an offer of invitation, and Brother Copeland's going to be down here, and if somebody wants to be saved, they can come down, shake his hand, and he'll get them with somebody to take them to a private prayer room. We'll show them in the Word of God how they can be saved, not tomorrow, not next week, but right now, today. That's my prayer. My second prayer is, Lord, for every one of us that say we're saved, that we'd start acting like it. It's time to be bold. It's time to stand up and stand out and speak out for Jesus. It's not about being political. It's about being right. And God, I, I beg you, Lord, that God's people, not just here at Liberty, but in our community and around this, this state of Texas and the country, Christians will start standing up and speaking in love the truth of God's word and then uh, let our actions, whether it be our lives or how we vote or whatever the case may be, that it would be right and it would line up with the word of God. God, we've got, an er we've got to eradicate the murderers that are aborting babies. And while we believe that their eternal souls go to be with you instantly, God, there's a life that's wasted. A son or a daughter that's wasted on the altar of convenience. God, help us. 
Lord, and it's incumbent. Up. And I was telling somebody, Lord, the other day, you, you, know, you know the conversation, a Christian that I was talking to as we were walking out the door and we were talking about the state of America, and I said, you know, the Bible still says, brother, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and if they will turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven, and I will heal their land. I'm ready for Jesus to come right now, but God, I don't, I don't want America to fall. I don't want America to be a laughing stock on the world stage. I don't want America to be a place where we have to hide in small rooms in people's houses to have church for fear of persecution or maybe even worse, martyrdom. So Father, help us, us, like Paul say, you know what, none of these things move me. Here I stand and here I'm going to stay until Jesus comes. Thank you, Father, for what you've done. And for the Lord Jesus Christ, when he died on an old rugged cross for my sin and the sins of the world, was buried, and the devil thought he had won. <clears throat> but on that third day, up from the grave, he arose. Over 400 witnesses saw him. And in Acts 1, we read where he ascended into heaven. And the angel said unto the three men looking up, steadfastly gazing into heaven, you men of Galilee, why I stand you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, this same Jesus, oh God, the one that healed the blind and made the lame to walk and the dead to rise again, this same Jesus that you're watching taking up from you, he's so coming, he's coming back just like he's going up. And God help us to know that today and let it impact our life. All of this that we do on Sunday mornings for nothing if it doesn't change us, if it doesn't cause us to reflect on what we've heard and seen today. So let us not just be hearers of the word, but doers. And all glory goes to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. The invitation's open. The song begins to play.